Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited you're here and uh, excited to see you at the crossroads so you won't be lonely if you get that reference. You're welcome. Uh, but I'm so glad you're here this morning uh, as we continue this series called The Cross. Road. Um, we've been looking at the stories that, that led up to Jesus' crucifixion there in the book of John. And, and so we're going to continue that today. But before we do, I just want to say, if you are new to Grace, uh, th- this is your first time here, or, first, or one of your first times here, we want you to know we're so glad you came. We were hoping you would come. We've been praying for you. And I would love to meet you and, and, and connect with you because we ultimately hope we'd love for you to be a part of the Grace family. And if you're here today and you're not sure what you believe, if you believe uh, someone just promised to buy you lunch if they come came with you, I'm so glad you're here uh, and I'm glad you're getting lunch out of the deal. All right. Uh, but we want you to know this is a place for you to journey in your faith and we'd love to answer questions that you might have uh, whenever you're ready to ask them. Th- this is a place for you. And so because ultimately here, here's my hope is that you will experience Jesus the way that I have and the way many of us have that has forever changed our lives. That's our hope, and, and we'd love that for you. So today, before we get rolling, I just want to pray and ask God to speak to us uh, through uh, His Word. So let's pray real quick. Father, thank You for today. Thank You for Your truth and, and for Your love. Now, Holy Spirit, will You move in this place? Will You speak to me and through me? And that we'd hear from You today in a way that changes our lives and helps us walk and live according to Your truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so I want to ask you, have you ever done something that played out differently in reality than it did in your head? It, it didn't happen exactly the way you expected it to happen. Uh, this just happened to me recently. And to explain, I have to give you a little context, all right? Um, my wife and I have never really uh, made a big deal about Valentine's Day. All right, it's just another day to us, but we, we've always kind of just given a nod to it here or there, right? Just a little nod, uh, buy a, a card, and, and often I would buy her a gift because her love language is gifts, and she'd be like, you weren't supposed to buy anything. I'm like, I know, but your love language is gifts. Like, same thing each year, right? And, and so it's not ever really been that big of a deal. But one night this last year when I was getting ready, um, I had to run to the store real late one night. It was a late night. All right, I'm going to emphasize it was late, okay? And I saw the cards and thought, man, I'm, I've got to grab a card for Julie. And I went in there and I read a card and it made me laugh out loud in the middle of the store. And I thought, this is the perfect card, even though I knew there was a little risk involved. <laughs> you see, my, my, my family had lost um, both of our family dogs in a matter of, of basically four months. And my wife and my boys had been begging for another dog, begging for a puppy, like nonstop. They were so persistent. And I was like, hey, here's the, uh, sure, we can get one. But th- there was a timing issue. There were some things, some very specific reasons why I was like, we will, but, but later, but, but not right now. So when I came across this card, uh, the outside of the card said, uh, I, I knew, uh, let's see, I, I knew you would love a puppy for Valentine's Day. And when you open the card, <laughs> and when you open the card, it said, so I got you a card full of puppies. And I had like 60 pictures of puppies in the inside of the card. So when my wife read the card, she thought, he better be bringing home a puppy. (laughs) The problem is, (laughs) I didn't. (laughs) And I just thought the card was funny and that she would think the card was funny too. The the problem is, she didn't. (laughs) Now, now, before you get ready to stone me, thinking, man, you are a jerk, all right? We have a puppy. We bought the puppy, all right? There's Gunner, all right? And it wasn't because I was in trouble either, all right? Really, for real. But, but we got the dog. But here's, here's the thing. <laughs> Both of us had unmet expectations, right? <laughs> My expectations of her laughing at the card might have been unrealistic, all right? I get that. But, but unmet expectations often leads to disappointment, right? Uh, unmet expectations in life and relationships 
but also all too often unmet expectations in our faith can lead to, un, to, to disappointment. When we expect God to do something and he doesn't, when God doesn't do what we want him to do or how we want him to do it or when we want him to do it, it, it can lead to disappointment and frustration with God. Maybe it's a sickness that we thought we'd be healed from by now. And, and, and we're going, God, what's the deal? You're, you're supposed to heal me. Maybe you lost a job or you didn't get the job that you thought, man, it belonged to me. I, I should have gotten that job. You didn't get the job, and it, you're kind of wondering, all right, God, where are you in this? Maybe there was a time that you stepped out in faith because you felt like God was saying, man, this is what you need to do. And you just knew that God was going to come through, and it doesn't seem like he did yet. Or maybe it's simply that we just thought following Jesus would make life easier, that our marriages would become magical. And that parenting would just become a piece of cake. And that our finances would flourish. And that all of our physical and mental and emotional struggles would cease. And all of our frustrations would fade away. And we probably wouldn't say it in those words, right? But when it comes down to it, there was this expectations that things in our lives, all these things would change for the better. Because deep down, we just thought Jesus would do more for us than it seems like he's doing at times. And so we can feel disappointed. Disappointed with our relationship with Jesus because we just don't think he's doing what we thought he would do. But you know what? We're not the first people to be disappointed because of unmet expectations. And in a way, it's the very reason they called for Jesus' crucifixion in his day. It's the very reason the religious leaders and the, the Jewish people wanted Jesus to be crucified. See, they knew what Jesus was capable of. They, they, they'd heard all the stories about how he made the blind to see and, and caused the deaf to hear again and was able to make the, the lame to walk again. Right? Uh, we, we, we talked about one of the miracles that was like this epic miracle we talked about two weeks ago where he, lays, he, he raised Lazarus from the grave after being in the grave for four days. And it was actually because of this uh, miracle that, that many believed and it created this incredible stir and, and people wanted to see for themselves so they flocked to Jesus because they wanted Jesus to rescue them and to save them. You see, they'd heard all about him. They'd heard all about what he could do. And so they just knew he had to be the one that growing up they'd heard about. This Messiah that the Jewish boys and girls would learn about at a young age and they would pray for and wait for and hope for. The one that God had promised to send to save his people. And they knew that Jesus, surely he was the one. That he was coming to establish the new kingdom. And we see this attitude and this mindset in the story we're going to look at today in John chapter 12. God used John, one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples, to record this eyewitness account of Jesus' life. And, and at this point in, in the book of John, we talked about two weeks ago, the, the, the raising of Lazarus. Last week, we looked at the story that happened just before this, where Jesus had dinner at Mary and Martha's house, and Mary had an, anointed his feet with, with, with uh, a perfume and, and spices and prepared him for burial, even though they didn't know that that's what it was at the time. And that's where we pick up in the story in John 12, starting with verse 12. It says, the next day... The, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. This festival that we're talking about is the Passover celebration. It, the Passover celebration was what they would celebrate to remember the time that God had rescued them out of harsh slavery, oppressive slavery in Egypt and brought them into the new land. How, how he delivered them on that final night of slavery from the death angel that passed over their doors. And they were spared. And they would celebrate it. And they would travel from all sorts of places coming to Jerusalem. And the, uh, scholars believe there was upwards of 200, I'm sorry, two and a half million people in Israel, in Jerusalem at this time. And there was a serious buzz about Jesus. 
Everybody was hoping to see. And, uh, because, listen, they'd heard all the stories about what Jesus had done. Listen, th- there were stories about him all over Face Scroll. <laughs> and, <laughs> this is a cheap one. Uh, but, but rumor had it. Listen, rumor had it that he was on his way to Jerusalem and the crowds wanted to see him in person. They wanted to see the one that they were convinced was the Messiah. And so they rushed out to meet him. Look what it says in verse 13. It says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, which means save now. Hosanna, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. This last part, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's in quotations, not just because they said it, but because they are quoting an Old Testament piece of scripture that they grew up knowing about. And the scripture that talked about how the, the saving, uh, the, the Savior would come, how the Messiah would come. They're, they're quoting from Psalm 118. It says, blessed is he who can, comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So as they're shouting this and and, and, and waving palm branches, they were essentially saying, we believe this is the one that God promised to send. They celebrated him as a savior, as the one that that was going to come and save them from their enemies. These palm branches were significant in this because when great warriors and conquering kings would return from a a, a victorious battle, they'd be welcomed into the city with these palm branches and the palm branches symbolized victory over their enemies. So as they lined the road celebrating Jesus, they're essentially saying, you're the one who's going to defeat our enemy. You're the one who's coming to save us. That's why it's called the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday. They celebrated him because they believed he was the one who could do what they couldn't do on their own. You see, they had been conquered by Rome over 80 years prior to this. And there have been many uprisings and rebellions that were started to try to overthrow the Roman government and reestablish their own kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. But none of them had succeeded. The the last one that that had happened, it happened around 4 B.C., It was an uprising that started in the city of Sepphoris, which is the capital of Galilee. And and the Roman government easily squashed the uprising and destroyed the city of Sepphoris and as well as the city of Emmaus. And if that wasn't enough, they marched all the way into the city of Jerusalem and publicly crucified over 2,000 Jews who were accused of being a part of the rebellion. To make their intolerance for rebellion known to all the Jewish people. So when Jesus comes and they are celebrating because they realize that, man, we can't do it on their own. But maybe this guy who is able to raise someone from the dead, maybe he can defeat our enemies. Maybe he's the one we've been hoping for and praying for that God would send to save us. And what better time to do it? There couldn't have been a better time. This was the week that they celebrated the last time that God rescued them, the last time that God saved them as a nation from oppressive slavery. So they waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, save now. And they celebrated him as a savior. It goes on. It says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, or people of Jerusalem. That's who it's referring to. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, here's the thing. When he's quoting this, this is another quote from Old Testament Scripture, telling the people how their Messiah would come, how to recognize the Messiah. And it's found in Zechariah 9.9. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Right? Same language here. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. And here's how he's coming. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. Hundreds of years before Jesus came. God used the prophet Zechariah to say, hey, this is how you will recognize when your Savior is coming, when when your king is coming. 
And so Jesus quotes this passage essentially saying, I'm him. I'm the one you've been waiting for, that you've been praying for. And the crowd believed it was him in the moment because they wanted to crown him as king. That they wanted to, to make him king and, and, and to, to, to establish the kingdom there. John captures this uh, saying he, he found a, a donkey, but in, in Matthew and uh, I'm sorry, in Mark and Luke's version of the story, two other guys that God used to record an eyewitness account of Jesus' life, they expand on this, this story about he found a young donkey because what he did as they were getting close to Jerusalem, he sent a couple of his disciples into town and said, hey, go find a, a, a young donkey, all right? He's going to be tied up. Just untie him and bring him to me. And they're like, Jesus, um, I don't know that people are just going to let us walk away with their donkey, all right? I'll just, and he, Jesus said, well, just tell them the Lord needs them. Oh, that sounds like a great plan, Jesus. All right, we'll do that. Well, sure enough, they get to town. They find this young donkey that's, that's tied up. And sure enough, people are looking at him. They're like, are you trying to steal our donkey in the middle of the day? What are you doing? And they ask, what are you doing? And they just say, well, the Lord needs them. And sure enough, they let them take the donkey with them. And not only was it a donkey, it was a young colt that had never been ridden on before. Now, this is significant, all right? It's significant because donkeys weren't pets. They were a means of income and wealth. And so the fact that it had never been ridden before meant they still had a lot of value, okay? There were still a lot of miles left on that model, all right? It hadn't been off the lot yet. But, but you see... People would use donkeys to carry goods from town to town. They'd use donkeys to go on a long journey. And the fact that they were located at the bottom of Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives, there's a really good chance that they would rent out their donkey to allow people to carry their sacrifice up to the temple to make their sacrifice and come back down. It was, it, it was a lot of risk for them, a lot of value involved. But yet their willingness to say, if the Lord needs it, I'm going to let them have it. Allowed them to be a part of the story that God was writing. Now, now there's a bit of a cultural contradiction between what the people are celebrating and what Jesus is doing. Because they're celebrating him as this conquering king, this mighty warrior. But he's coming into town riding on a donkey, not a noble steed. See, when conquering kings would come back from battle, they would choose the biggest, tallest, most, most uh, prestigious horse possible, as tall as it could be, because it was a statement of power. And yet Jesus is coming in, not just on a donkey, but on a colt, on an a animal that was a common animal ridden by common people from town to town. And when people came riding on a colt, it, it, it symbolized they were coming in peace. They wanted a, a, a mighty warrior king that would stir up a battle and, and create a revolt. And he was coming as a humble servant king. See, they wanted a warrior and they wanted someone who would come and, and rescue them and establish a kingdom. And the reality is, is that Jesus did come to rescue them. And he did come and establish a new kingdom. But it wasn't the way they expected it wasn't what they expected. In fact, no one understood it at the time. We know this because in verse 16, it actually says, at first his disciples didn't understand all this. The very ones who walked with Jesus and did ministry with Jesus for three years didn't even get it. If anybody got it, they should have gotten it. And John's going, we didn't get it. We didn't understand it. He says, only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him. And that these things had been done to him. It was only after he was glorified. What it means is, is that they didn't get it. So when Jesus was led away to be crucified, they all fled and they all ran. And they went into hiding because afraid that they would be next. They didn't get it. And even though Jesus had said, hey, I'm going to come back. I'm going to rise from the grave in three days. He told them that point blank multiple times. None of them there at the tomb the third day going, here he comes. Welcoming committee, let's go. They didn't get it. They didn't get it until they saw the resurrected Jesus with their own eyes. 
And he proved to them over 40 days before he rose into heaven that he was really alive. And they saw him rise back into heaven for themselves. It was only then that he was glorified and they began to put the pieces together and go, hey, remember when he said this? Remember when he did that? That was all part of the puzzle. It was only when he was glorified that it began to make sense. They were able to put the pieces together. But in the moment, they didn't get it because he didn't fit their expectations. So rather than receiving them at him as their king, they chose to kill him as a criminal. To suffer a criminal's death, crucifixion, public humiliation. The, same, the very same crowd that called for him to be crowned as their king just a few days later called for his crucifixion. It's, it's this triumphal entry that became this triumphal tragedy. They wanted a king, but they wanted him on their own terms. They wanted him him to avenge their personal persecution and establish a a physical throne in Israel. And they wanted him to make their lives easier and, and make their lives less stressful and make their lives more prosperous. Because when it came down to it, here's what happened. They recognized him as a savior, but yet rejected him as their king. And we do the same thing. We come to church and we sing praises to God and we listen to his truth and we fail to, then we fail to follow his truth in our lives. We fail to follow his example and allow God change, to change the way we live. Right? We, just, we just work to be good people who do right things. We just have to, we just, we're good compared to other people. I mean, there's a lot worse people out there than us. I'm a pretty good person. We even go to church and we pray and we might even sing. And listen, if we feel like the church is doing some good things, we we might even give a little bit to the church. We we say we have faith, but we don't actually follow Jesus' example. How to love God and how to love people. We celebrate Jesus as our Savior, but we've never surrendered to him as our king. There's parts of our life that we say, yeah, God, you can have that. But other parts we go, well, this is just the way I am. And and, and this just is never going to change. And this is just my part. And I'm going to hold on to this. I'm not going to say that with my words. I'm just going to say that with my actions. See, we do this when we continue to chase after the desires of our sinful flesh and seek pleasure the way the, Lord, the, the world says that pleasure is to be found. We do this when we don't love and serve our spouse the way that God has clearly told us to love and serve our spouse, when we don't follow God's design for relationships. We do this when we praise God with our lips one moment and then turn around and we curse or gossip about the very creation that was created in His image. We do this and we say God's our provider, and we look to God as a provider, but we refuse to give back the 10% that he says is his. We do this when we say <clears throat> we follow Jesus, but we don't look any different than the world that we live in. We do this by trading a relationship, a personal relationship with God for just religious behavior and just looking religious. Jesus addressed this when he was criticizing the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees. There was a guy named Matthew, one of his disciples, and an eyewitness to Jesus' life that God used to record what he was saying. And Matthew, he's talking to these religious leaders, and he says, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Isaiah wrote wrote the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. It's it's prophecies that were written hundreds of years prior to this. And Jesus is saying, hey, you remember what Isaiah wrote? It's about you. He said, this is what he wrote. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You're super religious. You honor me with all this pomp and circumstance. But when it comes down to it, what you say you believe and the way you live your life don't line up. He says, because of that, their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. They're just about religion. They're not interested in a relationship. There's another guy that God used later in, in the New Testament, a guy named Titus. 
And he used them to write these, these letters to the, to the early church leaders. And in Titus 1, he talks about this uh, kind of behavior as well. Uh, he, he says, For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. These, these people in the circumcision group thought they had the corner on the market and just basically told everybody, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. It's faith in Jesus plus circumcision. They essentially thought that they were better than anyone else and everyone else. And he says, hey, they're just as rebellious as the next person. And, and their talk is full of foolishness and deception. And in verse 16, he says, they claim to know God, by their, but by their actions, they deny him. Let that sink in. They claim to know God, but by the way they live, by their actions, they deny him. He says they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. They think they're good. But their talk doesn't align with their walk. See, when we fail to actually follow and apply his truth to our life and, and, and let him change the way we live, we're, we're just like the crowd that, that called for Jesus' crown one day and then called for his crucifixion just a few days later. See, see we, we can often read this story and criticize that crowd for being so fickle. But we have the benefit of reading the story in its entirety in the midst of that moment. They faced unmet expectations. They, fed un they, they uh, faced uncertainty. And when we are in the midst of those same circumstances, we often respond the exact same way. And his call to you and his call to me is still the same. That we would recognize him as your savior and receive him as your king. That you would put your faith in him to save you and then fully surrender to him as your king. Trust his ways even when you don't understand. Listen, this is something we all need and it's available to everyone. And we all need it because we all sin. Sin's doing things our own way instead of God's way. And in essence, it's rejecting God in our lives saying, no, I got a better way and I don't want you to be king of my life. And that's sin, and sin has broken our relationship with God, and there's nothing we can do about it. No one can be good enough to, to fix what our sin has done. The good news is God did something for us. That's why Jesus came. He sent Jesus in the form of a human who walked the earth, and he did not sin. And then he went to the cross to take our place, to take our punishment, uh, to, to, to pay the penalty for my sin and for your sin. They put him in the grave and three days later he rose from the grave defeating the power of sin so that anyone, regardless of what you've done or where you've been or your background, anyone who would admit that they've sinned and believe that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin and what he did was enough and that he rose from the grave and you came to a place where you just said, man, I want to put my faith in you and trust you in my life that you will be forgiven of your sin and saved and brought into a new life with Jesus Christ. He tells us that he, he delivers us from the kingdom of darkness and brings us into a new kingdom, his kingdom, the very kingdom that Jesus came to establish here on earth, a spiritual kingdom. He wants us to put our faith in him to save us, but also to surrender to him as our king. Maybe for some today, you need to put your faith in him and take that first step. And maybe for some today, it is that you put your faith in him to save you. But if you're real honest with yourself, he hasn't been the king of your life, maybe ever, or maybe for a long time. And maybe today's the day that you get a new start. Maybe today's the day you say, enough's enough. He's going to be my king from now on. And we're not talking perfection. We're talking a change of direction. Maybe today's the day we make that decision. And the truth is, for those who've put our faith in Jesus, we have a responsibility to others to help them find what we have found. And we, we actually see this happen in the story in John 12. It goes on and says, Now the crowd that was with him, with Jesus, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. They couldn't stop talking about it. And we shouldn't be able to stop talking about what God has done and the goodness in our life. It should be a part not just of our Sunday conversation, but we should begin to look at how do we talk about this with our family around the table? How do we talk about this at work? How do we talk about this with our friends? How do we help people know how important God is to me and what he's done in my life and how he's forever changed me? 
that we continue to spread the word. It goes on and says, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. That they heard because they were spreading the word. They were telling them. And they said, man, we just got to hear more. We got to experience him for ourselves. He goes on and says that the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Can I tell you something? That's our hope. (laughs) That's our hope is that we'll get to be a part of helping the whole world go after him. We exist to inspire and equip people to know and follow Jesus. That's where hope is found. That's where real life is found. That's where peace is found. That's where meaning is found. And our hope, our desire is to help the whole world go after him. Very quickly, how we do that, easy way to do that, first of all, just spread the word. Talk about what God has done. Talk about your story, how he's changed your life. Put, put it on Facebook. There's a lot of worthless stuff out there. Put something out there that leads to hope. Spread the word. Invite people to come and experience them for yourself. We, we do these invite cards, not just so you have something put on the refrigerator to remind you when Easter Sunday is. I hope you kind of figure that out. It's so you can take it and invite people to come and experience, and come and sit with me at church. Come and experience what, what God can do in your life. Spread the word and make more room. I will say this, our busiest services on Easter Sunday are always 9, 30, and 11. And here's what I would say. We need to make more room for those who are going to come. Last year, we had over 100 people who had to sit, I like to say, in additional seating, not overflow, right? In additional seating. Here's what I know. Additional seating out in the lobby is not the most engaging experience. I, I want people to be able to be in this room so that they can be engaged with God's truth and hear about his hope and the peace and the, the love that we find in Jesus. So I'd ask that, that, that those who can, that we make more room by going to one of the other services. There'll be three on Saturday, four on Sunday. And hey, help make more room at our busiest services. But ultimately, here's what I would say. I would ask all of us, this is what I'm doing, is that we pray for salvation. God tells us in 2 Peter that it's his desire that none would perish and that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Will you join me in praying for that to happen here? That any person who walks through the door who doesn't know Jesus will come to know Jesus here and experience salvation here. Pray for that for Easter, for next week. We, we do that at least this week. Every day, pray for salvation, for people to put their faith in Jesus. But don't stop there. Let's continue to pray for that as a church. And then here's one other very simple way. is just sign up to serve. There's going to be thousands of people on this campus next week, and we want to be ready for them to create a welcoming, engaging environment that helps let down the, 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 uh, any reservations. And, and, and I always say, I want, I want to, to create a place where people come in with their arms crossed, but by the end, their arms come down and they're leaning in going, man, I've never heard it said like that before. I've never experienced this before. I, I need to know more. I want to know more. I may not agree with the, what that crazy guy with the white shoes said on, there, uh, on Sunday, but I'm coming back because there's something different about that place, and I've got to figure it out. And, and here's why it's so important. I'll wrap up. Because there is someone who has been praying for their friend or their neighbor or brother or their spouse to, to just take a chance and to come with them sometime to church. And there's a chance that this week they'll say yes. And they'll show up. And when they do, we want to be ready to create an engaging experience where we present God's truth in hopes that they will lean in and experience Jesus for themselves and recognize Jesus as their Savior and receive him as their King. That's our hope. That's our heart. That's our prayer. So today, as as we celebrate Jesus, the reason we celebrate is because he is our Savior. And he is our King. And one day he is coming back and he's going to be riding on a white horse. No donkey this time. And those who know him will join with him in celebration. My hope and our hope is that we will all be there. 
But maybe today you need to take that first step by putting your faith in Jesus. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a second that, 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 that will vocalize that decision. The prayer itself doesn't save you. What saves you is you being honest with God, just admitting that you've sinned, believing that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose from the grave, and, and, and choosing to put your faith in him. Say, I want to put my faith in you to save me, and I want to trust you with my life. Maybe some today, your decision is simply, I've, I've never made you king. Or I, you haven't been king of my life in a long time. God, will you help me take that first step? I want you to be king of my life. I don't know how to do that. Will you help me take the first step? Maybe today you just have that kind of honest prayer with God right where you are. Maybe today you begin praying that God would create, uh, would, would, would stir up salvation here at Grace for next week as we celebrate Easter and the hope that we have. We bow your heads and close your eyes. And today, if you'd say, I need to put my faith in Jesus, tell him something like this right where you are. God, I know that I've sinned. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sin. And that he rose from the grave. And I don't have it all figured out. But I know I need you. So today I put my faith in you to save me. And I want you to be king of my life. So will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Change me from the inside out. And help me know you and follow you for the rest of my life. God, my prayer is for all of us who put our faith in you to save us, that you would be our king, that we would surrender to you and let your truth change the way we live. They will spread the word and tell others about the greatness of our God so others can know and follow you as well. God, we do pray for salvation, that the, those who don't know you will experience you for themselves and they'll find the peace and the hope and the joy and the love that's found in you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.